No. It can't be. I don't believe it. Morning, Mr Jenkins. <laughs> Bailey, is it really you? No, it ain't me. It's my oldest son. He's a credit to his father, isn't he? Do you know the pair of top boots when you see them? Do you know the slap-up sort of button when you see it? I've got the right sort of governor now. Who is he? The secretary's salary, David, that office now being established, is £800 per annum. House rent, coals and candles free, of course. Your five and twenty shares you continue to hold. Is that enough for you? Quite enough. And then I shall propose it at the board meeting. In my capacity. As chairman. Board meeting? You're a caution, Tig. Say Montague, please, David. I should prefer you to address me as Montague, even in private. After all, I am chairman of the Anglo-Bengalee Disinterested Loan and Life Assurance Company. Shall we go down? How's everybody at Todgers? Very well, I think. Except for poor model. The silly fellow has been inconsolable ever since Miss Pecksniff's marriage to Jonas Chuzzlewit was announced in the newspaper. Miss Charity married? Why, I practically made the match myself. No, not Miss Charity. That was why Model took it so hard. Miss Mercy. So he married the merry one in the end, did he? Well, well. I don't think they'll be suited. Hello? Yes, sir? We're going to head office. I'll drive. Yes, sir. Whoa. Not bad, eh? Give me regards to all at Todgers. I will. Say genius, Cripple. Genius. It was a capital idea, wasn't it? The Anglo Bengali. My yeah. idea, Cripple. My idea. But my capital. Mostly. I deserve a little credit in the business. And you have it. The plain work of the company, books, figures, circulars, sealing wax and wafers, is admirably done by you. But the ornamental department, David. The inventive and poetical department. It is entirely yours. I don't dispute it. Thank you, David. Thank you. What are the company's assets according to the next prospectus? <laughs> A figure of two, and as many noughts after it as the printer can get into the same line. <laughs> 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 Chairman, I say. Chairman of the Anglo-Bengali Company. Make way, I say. Hold me. Yes, sir? Tell the medical officer I should like to speak to him. Yes, sir. Here I am, Mr. Montague. Ah. Dr. Chopley. Wait outside, please, Bullman. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Crimple. How are you? A little worn with business? Let me recommend some lunch. Very wholesome thing at this time of day to settle the gastric juices. You too, Mr. Montague. Hmm. Lunch, Bullman. Yes, sir. Oh, not on my account, I hope. <laughs> You're very good. So, the board is met. <laughs> I am not, of course, strictly speaking, a member of the board, gentlemen. Merely a medical consultant. You've earned commission on four new policies, though, I see. Jobling, dear man, well done. 
<laughs> no. no, no, nonsense. Upon my word, I have no right to draw the commission. My patients ask me what I know, and I tell them what I know. If they put any question to me about the capital of the company, I tell them I have no head for figures. If they ask me about Mr. Montague, I tell them I'm proud to name him among my friends. House, everything belonging to him in London, beautiful. Costly furniture on a most elegant and lavish scale. And as to the offices, I tell them to go and see for themselves. And they do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> um, uh, lunch. Good man, Bellamy. Damn fine, my dear, I said. Mm -hmm. The last time I tasted anything as good was at a funeral. Ooh. You haven't seen anything of that party, I suppose. If he's dead, I've no wish to do so. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no, the funeral was for his father. He died of an apoplexy. Jonas Chuzzlewit, Esquire? Mr. Chuzzlewit is the sole inheritor of what to judge by the style of the funeral, must be a very considerable estate. Naturally, I told him where to go if he ever thought of insuring his life. Very civil, Jobly. <laughs> Come. Gentlemen requests the favor of an interview, sir. Speak of the devil. Mr. Jonas Chuzzlewit. My dear Chuzzlewit. I'm delighted to see you. Now, let me introduce our chairman, Mr. Montague. Most welcome, my dear sir. Well, why do I say our chairman? He's not my chairman, you know. <laughs> Simply because I hear the phrase constantly repeated about me. Such is the involuntary operation of the mental faculty in the imitative biped, man. <laughs> this is our company secretary, Mr. Crimple. Very pleased to make your acquaintance. Now, you gentlemen have business to discuss? I have several patients to visit, so I will bid you good day. Yes, I must be going too, if you'll excuse me. Certainly, Crimple. Mr. Chuzzlewit and I will have a cosy tete-a-tete. Please sit down, Mr. Chuzzlewit. If I come here to ask a question or two and to take a document or two to consider thereof, it doesn't bind me to anything, you know. Let that be understood. My dear fellow. I applaud your caution. Please. Why should I disguise what you know so well, but what the crowd never dream of? We companies are all birds of prey. The only question is whether, in serving our own turn, we may also serve yours. You ain't a bad man of business, Mr. Montague. The truth is... Don't say truth, it's humbug. The long and the short, then, much better, is that I don't consider myself very well used by one or two of the older companies in some negotiations I had with them. They started objections they had no right to start and put questions they had no right to put. Tut, tut. And now I've married a wife. She's young and healthy, but you never know with these women. So I'm thinking of ensuring her life. That's very prudent. Provided I could do it cheap and easy and without bothering her. For it is in a woman's way to take it into her head that if you talk to her about these things, she's going to die directly. So it is. Sweet, silly things they are. <laughs> Jobling recommended you very warmly to me, Mr. Montague. But he couldn't tell me anything about company security. The paid-up capital, my dear sir, at the present moment... Oh, I know all about paid-up capitals. Do you? I should hope so. Do you know me? Well, I have been thinking as I sat here that there's something familiar about you, but I can't recall them. Mr. Pecksniff's parlour? By God. You're the fellow that came to warn us old Martin Chuzzlewit had given us the slip. 
the very same. Oh, God, you've prospered since then. I have, indeed. And so could you, if you took premiums instead of pay. What do you mean? Join us. Come over here a minute. There are printed calculations which will tell you pretty nearly how many people pass up and down that thoroughfare in a single day. But I can tell you how many of them will come into this office to buy annuities, effect insurances, bring us their money in a hundred shapes and ways, force it upon us, trust us with it as if we were the mint and yet know no more about us than you do about that crossing sweeper there. Why? Simply because we look the ticket. A Bullamy's red waistcoat is worth a hundred pounds to us a week. But you knew that already, you dog. Dine with me tomorrow in Pall Mall. I will. Look over these papers in the meantime. See, B wants a loan, say 50 or 100 pounds, perhaps more, it's no matter. B proposes self and two securities, B is accepted. The two securities give a bond. B assures his own life for double the amount and brings two friends' lives with him. Is that not a good notion? A capital notion. We do it. Do it? B is hard up and will do anything. B pays the highest lawful interest. It ain't much. True. But we have his policy and his two friends' policies, and we charge B for the bond, and we charge him for inquiries by our Mr. Nadgett prior to the loan, and we charge him a trifle for the secretary's services, and in short, my good fellow, we stick it into B, uphill and down Dale, and make a devilish comfortable little property out of him. Yes, but what happens when they begin to fall in? What happens when your policies begin to die? Good question. Why, you're as bold as brass. A man may well afford to be as bold as brass, my good fellow, when he gets gold in exchange. Dine with me tomorrow night, 7.30. Hmm? Here's my card. I can see that you're going to join us. Well, I don't know about that. There's a good deal to be looked at, yeah. And look you shall. Take these documents. Pull them here until tomorrow. Kindly show Mr. Chuzzlewit the way out. Is Nadget there? Ah, Nadget. Any information about this person? I should be glad to have myself. Anything you can glean, bring to me. To me, Mr. Natchett. May I trouble you to pass the gooseberry preserve, my dear? What is amiss between us? Why are we disunited? Don't talk humbug, Pa. Humbug? This is very hard. Hard? For who? Will you state the cause, Pa, or shall I? Was I not made a convenience of? Were my feelings not trifled with? No, I wonder you don't have more spirit. If Mr. Jonas did not care for you, why should you wish to have him? I wish to have him. I wish to have him. 
Mercy is welcome to the wretch. And why make all this fuss? Because I was deceived! Because my own father and my own sister conspired against me! Shh, be quiet. I've been more shamefully used than anybody ever was in this world. In any case, that's not the only thing. I'm not a total fool, you know, Pa. And I'm not blind. All I have to say is that I won't submit to it. You labour under some misapprehension, my dear. But I will not ask you what it is. Then I shall tell you. Let us avoid the subject, whatever it may be. Oh, I wish to be able to avoid it altogether, Pa. Mm -hmm. By removing myself. Removing yourself? I must ask you to place me on an independent footing. I will not suffer any further humiliation in this house. Well, my good sir, and how is my dear friend? Oh! It's you, Pekshev. I didn't hear you approach. I asked you how you were this delicious morning. She's gone for a walk in the woods. She brought me here first. No, no, not Miss Graham. You, my dear sir, you. How are you? I? Oh. Not too well, Pexner. I'm not the man I was. Oh, well, I, I'm sorry to hear it. When it comes to us all in the end, change is the condition of human life. Now, for instance, I must part with my dear Cherry. Is she getting married too, then? Oh, no, 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 my dear sir. No, she, she's not been in the best of spirits of late, as you may have noticed. She misses her dear sister. I think of giving her a run in London. A good long run, if I find she likes it. I trust you and Miss Graham will continue to bear me company while she is away. I've no intention of removing yet a while. Oh, I, I'm delighted to hear it. Why, my dear sir, don't you come and stay with me? Now that Cherry is going, Miss Graham could have my girl's room, which would be more, um, pardon me for saying, more suitable than her present accommodation at the Dragon. That is kind of you, Pecksniff. Oh, my dear sir, if I could only say how deep an interest I take in you and your beautiful young companion. She need have someone interested in her. I sometimes think I did wrong to train her as I did. When I'm gone, she'll have no protector but herself. Perhaps her position could be altered. You think I should make a governess of her or a semstress? Heaven forbid! There are other ways. What other ways? Uh, really, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited at the prospect of your extended visit that I... I hardly know what I mean. Uh, permit me to um, resume the subject on another occasion. As you please. I think I will take a walk to calm my thoughts. Now go and sit in your parlour, if I may. I tire easily these days. Excuse me. Of course. You would leave the recompense to me if we accept your hospitality. Oh, do not speak of recompense. That is an absolute condition. If you insist, my dear sir. Very well.
communing with nature, Miss Graham. So am I. I... I was just going home. So am I. Take my arm, sweet girl. No, thank you. Why so fast? You would not shun me, would you? Yes, I would. Release me, Mr. Pecksniff, please. I'm glad we met. I'm very glad we met. I am now able to ease my bosom of a tender secret. Can you guess what it is? Please, let me go! Oh, hear me out. I love you, Mary. I love you, my gentle dove, with a passion which is quite surprising even to myself. Although I am a widower, I am not encumbered with dependence. I have a character I hope people are pleased to speak well of me. My manner and person is not absolutely that of a monster, I trust. Hmm? I have reason to believe that our venerable friend will look kindly on our union, and when he is wafted to a haven of rest, we shall console each other. What do you say, my pretty primrose? I cannot listen to your proposal, Mr. Pecksniff. If you have any sense of honor, you will release me at once. Of course, a certain maidenly reluctance is natural under these circumstances and only adds to your charm, my dear. Great heavens! Will nothing move you? Must I tell you that I loathe and detest you? It is a curious fact, but it is difficult, you know, for anyone to ruffle me. Mr. Chuzzlewit shall know of this. Oh. I shall tell him. No, you will not. There are two Martin Chuzzlewits, and your carrying your anger to one might seriously affect the other. What more can my Martin suffer? <laughs> you, Martin. Oh, yes, I did hear there was some childish fondness between you. When we are married, you shall have the satisfaction of doing him some good. I have some influence with Mr. Chuzzlewit, I think. Heaven knows why. And he is not the man he used to be. I see in him the same symptoms of irreversible decline that I observed in his brother just before he died. Oh, don't say that. I believe that he would listen favorably to any proposal I made in his grandson's interest. And of course, by the same token, I could strengthen his prejudice against the young man. You will consent, my dear. You will consent, I know, when you have had time to reflect. In the meantime, let us keep this little secret to ourselves. Ah, you naughty hand. <laughs> Why did you take me prisoner? Go, go. Bandy or not bandy, come on, pick. <laughs> bandy or grace, my Lord Harry, said I. Uh, yes, yes, the Duke. True is. man of the world, my dear sir. For a professional person like myself, it's very refreshing to come into this kind of society. <laughs> More wine. Oh, yes, as much of that as you like. I thought it best not to have a party. I hope you approve. Why, what do you call this? Uh, oh, it's just a little informal gathering of friends. Crimple said to me, you'll have a party for Chuzzlewit. No, I won't, I said. He'll take us as we are, in the rough. Oh. Seems pretty smooth to me. <laughs> it didn't cost you a trifle, I'll wager. That's the way I like to spend my money. You shan't get rid of your profits in the same way, I fancy. No, you're right there. Not that I'd definitely agree to join mine. No, of course not. No, you must take your time. But let us not spoil such an excellent wine with talk of business. Your good health. You're a good man, Montague. <laughs> All we have to do is reel him in. He signs tomorrow. Meanwhile, Bailey can take him home. In a hackney cab.
it you? Don't be frightened. I bought him Mr. Chuzzlewit. But he ain't ill, only a little swiper, you know. Have you come from Mrs. Todgers? <laughs> Lord bless you, nah. I done with Todgers long ago. Your husband's been a dining with the governor in the West End. Didn't you know? No. Don't you stand here a-catching your death a cold. I'll get him. of his life. You mewling white faced cat. I know you don't mean it, Jonas. Bailey, my good boy, go home now. Mean it? Oh, of course I mean it. Things have opened to me now where I see I could have married anyone I liked. You wouldn't say such things if you were sober. Bailey, please take this for your kindness and be gone. Because you made me bear your humours once or now. I'll make you bear mine. Are you sure you're all right? Quite sure, thank you. Take this candle with you. And the front door shut behind you. It's late, Jonas. Won't you come to bed? Fetch me some ale. I've a raging thirst. You've had enough to drink tonight. Come to bed. Leave me alone! No, Jonas, don't! <laughs> oh! Stop that mewling! I'll give you some more of the same medicine! <laughs> I don't curtsy, but I don't know as I should be able to straighten up again. Ah, you, do, you do seem to be somewhat encumbered. Uh, girls, help Mrs. Gap with her bags. Oh, <laughs> thank you, dear. Mm. Oh, that's very kind of you, sir. Oh, oh. Oh, I might be going away for two days, but you never know what you might need in the country. The country? That's unusual for you. Yes, it's all account of that gentleman at the ball what I've been nursing for the month or more. Really? How is he? Oh, dear. Of all the tried ill in this valley of the shadow, he beats him black and blue. A person who's a constitution made of bricks to stand it. But why the country? Oh, Mr. Westlock, the gentleman what's looking after him. He thinks he'd be better off in Hertfordshire, which is his native air. So I'm going down on a coach with him this morning and stay to get the country nurse. Yeah, but native airs won't bring him round. Your native grace is now, if you ask me. My services may be required yet, then, Mrs. Gap. All after that, sir, I don't rightly know. But there's fevers in the mind as well as the body. <laughs> you may take your sleeping draughts till you flies in the air with ever wishes, but you won't cure that. 
The thing he says in his sleepers would make your blood cool, Mr. Bolt. <sighs> Mrs. Dodgers. Oh, Mr. Model, you made me jump. Mrs. Dodgers, <sighs> did I dream or did I see Miss Charity arriving earlier? No, Mr. Model, you weren't dreaming. Miss Charity has come to stay with me for a while. Oh, Mrs. Dodgers, do you think she would permit me to sit with her sometimes? Well, I don't see why not. It would be a comfort to me to contemplate her nose. Nose. Her profile in general, but particularly her nose. It's so like. <laughs> it's so like hers who is another's Mrs. Todgers. Now, Mr. Morton, <laughs> if you want Miss Charity to be civil to you, you are going to have to stop acting like a water pump and going on all the time about another's. It was very hard. <laughs> but I will try. That's the spirit, Mr. Model. Head up. There. You look charming. I feel as if I was in someone else's clothes. <laughs> I'm all on one side. And you made one of my legs shorter than the other. Oh, well, always complaining. I suppose you don't like that neither. Why do you make me sit upon a bottle? Ah, you take the man. If he ain't been a got my night bottle in his pocket. <laughs> morning, ladies. Good morning, Lucent. All ready? My dear fellow, you look like a Guy Fawkes effigy. Mr. Lucent, it's an easy jet to get into his clothes. Sir. Oh, best luck. How can I thank you for your kindness, sir? Say no more about it. I'm glad to have the means to help you. There is something else I have to say to you. Something which has been a dreadful weight on my mind throughout this long illness. Is it the matter you wish to discuss with me before you became ill? May I leave it till I feel stronger? <sighs> my dear fellow, of course. Huh. Country air and a change of scene will make a new man of you. The coach is ready. Uh, let's see if we can manage the stairs together, shall we? seen once since her marriage and then I thought her looking rather poorly. My dear, I always thought you were to be the lady. Oh dear, no. Oh no, thank you, <laughs> Mrs. Dodgers. There was no such intention on my side, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I dare say you were right. <laughs> but the Misery we have had from that match here in this house, my dear Miss Pecksniff, nobody would believe. Yeah. Awful. Awful. You remember my youngest gentleman, Mr. Mortal? Of course. And how a kind of stony dumbness came over him whenever he was in your sister's company? No. No, I don't remember that. Oh, my dear. Dear, I have seen him again and again sitting over his pie at dinner with his spoon at perfect fixture to his mouth, gazing at your sister. Well, I never noticed it, huh? But when the marriage took place, when it was in the paper and read out by Mr Jenkins at breakfast, I thought he had taken leave of his senses. I did indeed. The extraordinary actions he performed with his tea and the, the clenching way in which he bit his bread and butter and violent abuse he heaped on Mr Jenkins. I shall never forget it as long as I live. If he hadn't been held down by three of my gentlemen, I believe he would have had Mr Jenkins' life with a bootjack. How absurd. I think he went into a decline. You could bring the tears into his eyes by just looking at him. I 
had such a turn yesterday when the housemaid threw his bedroom carpet out of the window. I thought it was him. He'd done it at last. It's a pity he didn't. Oh, fine, <laughs> Charity. He should live to enjoy his prospects. There's no harm in the poor lamb. He has prospects, does he? Oh, very promising young lawyer, oh. I understand. And how is your princely pa? If I am not mistaken, he has his eye on a new princess. I wouldn't have believed. That is why I am here. I won't bear it. Quite right, my dear. Well, it only goes to show there's no trusting a man. They're all playthings of their passions. so. Besides, it's a true saying that nothing travels so fast as ill news, so you may depend upon it that he's all right. You were a great comfort to me, Mr. Pinch. I wish I could have served you more in that way, but... But what? It will seem very foolish, very presumptuous and ridiculous of me, but... I feared you might suppose it possible that I should admire you too much for my own peace. Mr. Pinch, I cannot tell you how much your silent care and friendship have meant to me these past weeks. You have been a good angel to me. I'm glad of it. If I too have seemed somewhat reserved, it was because I didn't wish to do you an injury with your employer. With Mr. Pecksniff. They've no reason to be afraid of him. He's not a spy. I fear you are mistaken. You astonish me, Miss Graham. I know what it is. Martin has prejudiced you against him. It is the most extraordinary circumstance. But every student Mr. Pecksniff has ever had has taken a violent dislike to him, except myself. But I know him better than all of them, and I can assure you he is the best of men. Mr. Pinch, I hope I don't offend you, but I know you are mistaken. No! It is you who are mistaken, Miss Graham. What's the matter? Have I said anything to hurt you? Pray tell me what is distressing you. The person whom you think the best of men. Mr. Pecksniff, yes, what of him? He's been making advances. To you. The other day, 
You waylaid me in the woods and forced me to listen to a proposal of marriage. What? He caught hold of me and wouldn't let me go. Fondled me in the most offensive way. Can this be true? Mr. Pecksniff? Absolutely true, I swear it. And he says that if I marry him, he will use his influence with Mr. Chuzzlewit to restore Martin's hopes. But if I refuse him, he will make sure they are never reconciled. Do you believe me? So they were right then. Who were right? John Westlock. Martin. And the others. Only I was fool enough to be taken in. No, it is a sad blow for you. I wouldn't have told you if I could have helped it. Yes, yes. Of course. Pecksniff, what's the matter? I am deceived, sir. Deceived? By whom? By someone in whom I placed unbounded trust. By Thomas Pinch, of all people. <gasps> Are you certain? Quite certain. But the worst of it is, his treachery hurts you also, my friend. How? You alarm me, Pecksniff. I'm not as strong as I was. Have no fear. I think I know my duty when I see it. Come in. Jane, has Mr. Pinch returned from his organ practice? Not yet, sir. When he does, tell him I wish to see him. Immediately. Yes, sir. Come in. You wish to see me, Mr. Pecksniff? Please be seated. What was that pretty piece of music you were playing this afternoon in church, Mr. Pinch? You were there? Yes, I was there, saying my prayers. Lulled by the music, I fell into a slumber from which I was awoken by the sound of voices. Your voice and Miss Graham's. From the fragments I overheard, I ascertain that you, Mr. Pinch, forgetful of all ties of honor and duty and regardless of the sacred laws of hospitality, have presumed to address Miss Graham in unreturned professions of attachment and proposals of love. I heard evidence of other treachery which I spare to mention now. You 
do not deny it, I see. No, I do not deny it. Oblige me by counting this money and putting your name on this receipt. It is your quarter's wages. from the dragon will carry your luggage to wherever you please. We part, Mr. Pinch, at once and are strangers from this time on. I'm glad he's gone. Mr. Pinch, so it's true that you've been dismissed? I wouldn't wish to stay here anyway, Miss Graham, except to protect you. What did he accuse you of? Of... of making professions of love to you. What? The man is utterly wicked. You denied it, of course. No. But... Pecksniff overheard our conversation in the church. If I denied it, he might have told Mr. Chuzzlewit that you were corresponding with Martin. But it's so unjust that you should suffer on my account. Where will you go? The dragon tonight. Tomorrow to London. I'll tell Mrs. Lupin that if any letter arrives from America for me, it should be handed to you. Goodbye, Miss Graham. I hope to see you again under happier circumstances. Goodbye, Mr. Pinch. And God bless you. Mrs. Lupin. I'm sorry I am to see you go, Mr. Pinch. I don't think there's a person in the village I could miss more, aside of Mark Tapley. You haven't any more news of him or young Mr. Chuzzlewit, I suppose? I'm afraid not. I'm sure they're all right. I do hope so. Here, take this with you. Do you want to deliver it somewhere in London? Oh, Lord bless you, sir, no. It's a little refreshment for the journey. <laughs> this is enough to feed the whole coach. No matter. Daniel will take you and your luggage to the crossroads. You're very kind, Mrs. Lupin. Goodness me, what are all these people doing here? I'm not the only person in the village who'll miss you, Mr. Pinch. Bonnie's a jolly good fellow. Bonnie's a jolly good fellow. Bonnie's a jolly good fellow. And so say all of us. And so say all of us. And so say all of us. Yes. Oh.